This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I now call upon Professor Sir Colin Blakemore, FRS, of the School of Advanced Study and Director of Senses, Institute of Philosophy, to give the oration for Mr. Patrick Hughes, our honorary graduate. <coughs> As Chancellor, in accordance with the Charter Statutes and Ordinances of the University, I present to you this person on whom we wish you to confer the degree of Doctor of Science, on Cousin. In 1969, a young artist arrived in London on a scholarship to study for the Diploma in Art Education at the Institute of Education. He was only 29 years old, but was already a senior lecturer in painting and drawing at Leeds Art College. Why, you might ask, did he want a diploma in art education? Well, the ev empirical evidence suggests that he didn't, or at least that he didn't want it enough to sit through the classes with the school teachers for whom the course was really intended. Instead, he did what he already knew how to do, he painted. I presume that this young artist, Patrick Hughes, enjoyed the paradox of being a an art teacher what was generally recognized as the best college of art in the country, studying art education in a place that didn't teach art. His problem with um, this paradox, unlike the endless railway lines and roads in some of his early work, is that this journey had an ending, uh, an examination of the diploma, which Patrick sat here in Senate House in 1970. He failed. Sonia Roof, one of his teachers, who I think is, is here today, puts a bright gloss on what happened. Uh, he failed, she says, in the most brilliant way. <laughs> she also notes that um, his attendance had not been good. Uh, Patrick's biographer, John Slice, noted that few have encountered a childhood as resoundingly bleak as young Hughes. Patrick himself has written, I did not much like my childhood, a place both miserable and over-emotional. Nevertheless, stories of discovery and wonder run through those early years. He was born in Birmingham on the 20th of October, 1939, but grew up in his grandparents' cottage in Crewe. Unfortunately, the Luftwaffe had taken a shine to Crewe because, as Patrick wrote, his grandfather was making Rolls-Royce aero engines there. In the absence of an underground uh, air raid shelter, four-year-old Patrick and his mother spent each night in a cupboard known as the Glory Hole. Patrick says that he slept not under the stars, but under the stairs. Um, but they were inside-out stairs that only a spider could walk up. This curious experience made a strong impression on young Patrick. There he was, he says, being bombed in the dark, and in bed with my mum again, where things were the wrong way around. <laughs> to the contrary mind of Patrick, the cottage contained many other Alice in Wonderland experiences. The front parlour that was, of course, never used, where the clock was always set ten minutes in advance of boring reality. The pair of mirrors on opposite sides of the room that gave a young lad in, in the middle a view of endless reflections, a glimpse of infinity. He tells the story of being given the job of polishing the brass wall plate that had an embossed raised image of a galleon. This chore gave Patrick the chance to discover magic in the reverse side of the plate, on which the inside-out galleon continued to sail on an inside-out ocean. Patrick's home environment was not a strong stimulus to sculpture. The only literature to be seen was the Radio Times. But young Patrick discovered the local library and developed a lifelong love of reading. His dull, real world was replaced with the imaginary world of the novelist. For Patrick, books were like little doors. You open the little hinged rectangle of the book and step out. Patrick's parents moved to Hull and he went to Hull Grammar School, where his teacher for O-level art constructed sets for the school plays. Patrick played a middle-aged vicar's wife in uh, one play, but was more interested in the sets because of the tricks that they played with perspective and because of the artificial shadows painted on false walls. Patrick wrote an essay in defense of Picasso, 
the O-level uh, examination scored exactly 47% the past month. He left school at 17, went to London, got a job as a window dresser and never looked back. In 1959, he enrolled at Leeds Day Training College to train to be an English teacher. At the very start of his course, he had to write about six books that he'd recently read and enjoyed. His teachers expected George Eliot, Jane Austen, Dickens, Brontes, Patrick gave them Franz Kafka, Christian Morgenstern, Eugene uh, Ionesco, Samuel Butler, Thomas Stern, N.F. Simpson. His penchant for brilliant failures had begun. He was rejected for English, but adopted eagerly by the art department. His already well-honed love of paradox, contradiction, and ambiguity burst out through his art. Magritte, Duchamp, de Quirico, and Clay were strong influences. Like them, Patrick developed his own ways of both amusing and disturbing the viewers of his work. He was technically versatile, using collage and constructions as well as flat paintings. Every work was intended to provoke contradictory interpretations. An example of particular interest to me is a work from 1962 called Cloakroom Ticket, painting a large digit one with the word two written on it. Patrick had discovered, perhaps independently, one of the most significant phenomena in the, in the science of perception, the Stroop effect, the way in which contradictions of visual and linguistic information confuse and slow down the interpretation of images. By 1961, at the age of 21, he had his first show at the Portal Gallery in London, the first one-man show by a so-called pop artist. Two-thirds of the works were sold. There was critical acclaim from such doyens as George Melly and David Sylvester. He was compared not only with Clay, but with Harold Pinter, Samuel Beckett, and Spike Milligan. In 1963, he got a job at Bradford School of Art. The next year, he moved to Leeds College. From there, in 1969, he came here for that magnificent failure at the University of London, and he then struck out as an independent artist living and working in London. Two works from the 1960s set Patrick on a path that he is still endlessly exploring, like one of the characters in an early illustration sitting on a train, rumbling forever around a circular track. In 1963, he made a construction entitled Infinity, a pair of railway lines that not just tilted together towards each other in deference to perspective, but literally touched at the top, making explicit that glimpse of, of infinity, like the view through the pair of mirrors in his grandparents' cottage. And in 1964, he made sticking out room, a solid construction of a living room with wallpaper and a door, but the room is reversed in shape, with a smaller, apparently distant wall actually sticking out towards the viewer. What is remarkable is not just that to the viewer, except very close up, it looks like a real room, but that it then seems to swing and sway in a very unroom-like way when the viewer moves around it. This was, with hindsight, the first work in a style that he's called reverse-spective, which is now his singular mode of art. In the 70s and 80s, he continued to explore paradoxes in his art. Doors made of brick, a hole in a wall forming a portrait of desperate Dan who had jumped through the wall. Ra rainbows stacked up in the corner of a room, or turning grey as they stream in through the bars of a prison cell. But increasingly, He's focused on reverse perspective as the culmination of his exploration of pictorial paradoxes. Stand in front of a huge reverse perspective painting and you'll admire the precision of the graphic technique and the power of perspective in the images. But these pictures use all the tricks of the sticking out room, pitting perspective and other so-called monocular cues to form and distance against the reality of the solid surfaces on which they're painted. This causes them almost literally to come to life as you move past them. As if controlled by you, the viewer, the pictures obligingly swing in the opposite direction. Doors in the image open. Bookshelves move around in their library. The Palazzi of Venice sail like boats through their canals. His work is now regularly exhibited at Flowers Gallery in, in London, 
has had exhibitions all over the world, in New York, in Santa Monica, in Seoul, in Chicago, in Munich, in Toronto. The Hughes reverse perspective painting, Paradoxy Moron, hangs in the foyer of the British Library, where you always find a little group of viewers bobbing, swaying, and usually laughing, too. Patrick's works hang in galleries and in institutions, commercial buildings around the world, and significantly, they also hang in university departments and research institutes, <coughs> reflecting the fascination that they have for scholars, especially those interested in how our brains deal with the apparently impossible task of understanding the outside world. We're fortunate to have one of Patrick's works here in the School of Advanced Study, and he's collaborating with our research group in the, in the Institute of Philosophy, helping with the design of stimuli that we're using to try to define the parts of the brain that analyze information in the two-dimensional retinal image in order to guess the nature of the mysterious third dimension of the world. Patrick has a long history of interaction with academic researchers, including Thomas Papa Thomas at Rutgers, and Brian Rogers in Oxford, and the leading expert in visual perception, Richard Gregory, who died a few years ago. A photograph illustrating, um, illustrating Gregory's obituary in the Times showed him in his study with a work by Patrick in the background. He's co-authored academic <coughs> papers on visual perception. He's written or edited six books of his own exploring themes that parallel his art, including the most recent, A New Perspective, published just a month ago on his 75th birthday. In his book, Paradoxy Moron, he examines contradictions and paradox in literature as well as in art. The book's infused with scholarship, full of glorious quotations. One heading in the preface reads, this book fills a much needed gap There's a much needed gap. Patrick is then a man of extraordinary talents and a cheeky fascination with life. He's a table tennis player extraordinaire. He runs 10 kilometers every other day. He dresses with elegance. He's a brilliant conversationist. And this in addition to being one of Britain's leading artists of the last century and this. So Vice Chancellor, I ask you to participate in the ultimate paradox in the life of Patrick Hughes. Returning to the site of his greatest academic failure 45 years ago, to receive an honorary degree. Vice Chancellor, it, was, it is with great pleasure that I ask you to confer the degree of Doctor of Science, honoris causa, on Patrick David Hughes. <laughs>